episode 31, Disciples of Jesus. What does Jesus expect of his followers? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What is the cost of discipleship? Join me as I work through what Jesus said about his expectations and requirements of his disciples, as well as the rewards he promises. This is a topic you'll want to take seriously. After all, what would be worse than thinking you were Christ's disciple when in fact you are deceived? You can gather an army of theologians together and survey their opinions, but in the end, all that really matters is what Rabbi Jesus says he requires. If you'd like to watch a video of this class or download the course notes, visit restitutio.org. Here is Historical Jesus, Part 7, Disciples of Jesus. Having looked at Jesus the Rabbi, do you remember that last time? We are now poised to consider what it means to be his disciple. As it turns out, Jesus spoke quite a bit about what he expected from his followers. So Jesus lived in a different society than us. He lived in the first century, so that's 20 centuries ago. He lived in a different continent, continent, spoke a different language. And his society was more based on honor and shame than ours is. In our society, we consider the pursuit of wealth to be significant. We consider popularity to be significant. You know, we have celebrities and fame, yeah, and those are different things in our society. For example, when the Super Bowl aired recently, 114, I think, 114 million people watched it, or 111. It was like the third or fourth most watched event on television in history. And, you know, so we live in a different world than Jesus and his disciples. And so what they really cared about was honor acquiring honor for your family, because they didn't think of themselves primarily as individuals. They thought of themselves primarily as families and as groups and as clans and as tribes and as a nation, um, and avoiding shame. So you, whatever could bring more honor to your, to your family and avoid shame would be more uh, what they would be interested in. And it would have been a great honor to be chosen to follow a rabbi which I think helps to understand why people are so willing to follow Jesus when they don't even know him yet. He goes up to people and he says, come follow me, and they're like, oh, okay. And they drop everything and they go follow him. You know, there's that one incident where he calls the first, uh, some of his first disciples and they're with their father, Zebedee, in the boat. And they're fishing. And they, they leave their father, they leave their profession, and the father doesn't put up any complaint at all. And so in a society where following a rabbi was considered an honorable position, he might not only not be upset about it, he might be bragging about it. Do you know who the rabbi chose? He chose my boys. He thinks they've got what it takes. So, you know, it's a different society than ours, so it's hard for us to judge it. So what we have to do, and it's very, very conscious to do this, is not shape Jesus by what we think he's, he should be or what our... What, various pictures or movies have told us, but we have to allow him to tell us what he thinks it takes to be a disciple. And when I look at this, I am quite surprised at how radical a commitment he asks of his followers. And uh, so we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, but Jesus' first uh, followers, he picks these 12 well, it's actually more than 12. Uh, quite a few people were, were following him. And then out of that bunch, he picked the 12. And in that 12, you see there, there's an eclectic group here. You have a tax collector. You have a zealot. And you have fishermen. You know, it's just people drawn from different aspects. And there are a number of women that follow Jesus, too. Luke talks about that in Luke chapter 8. He mentions Mary Magdalene, out of whom seven demons have been cast out. He mentions Joanna, who was the wife of Herod's household manager. So Herod Antipas, who had arrested John the Baptist, uh, the, the, the man who ran his house, his wife was on the road following Jesus. <laughs> and uh, Susanna, as well, was mentioned in, in Luke chapter 8. And it says there were many other women and that they provided for Jesus out of their means. So that was a significant part of how Jesus was able to fund his itinerant ministry, traveling from village to village. The disciple 
is someone that lived with Jesus, that followed him, literally walked behind him or next to him as he went along the way, and they wanted to be like him. The whole idea of a, of a disciple is to be like the teacher. Um, and if, if rabbi isn't a suitable example, Jesus is also considered a prophet. And we see in uh, the Old Testament, Elijah, when he's looking for a successor, he throws his mantle over Elisha, and Elisha is willing to totally leave everything. He, burned, he, he sacrifices his oxen, and he burns the yokes, and he follows Elijah. And so we see this in their culture. This was something that would happen. And anyhow, the disciple, the Greek word for disciple is mathetes, whence we have the English word math, which means learn, or uh, a learner, or a student, or an apprentice. And so a disciple is somebody that disciplines themselves to learn the teachings of the master. And so it's important for us not to impose on Jesus what we think a good teacher would do or say, or what a proper religious leader would do or say, but let him define it for us. And so Jesus says, for example, in Luke 6.46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? For Jesus... If you are going to call him Lord, you should do what he says. In John 8, 31, we read, If you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. So abide in his word is significant. And he says, if you do that, if you remain in my teaching, if you abide in my word, then you're truly my disciples. This is what Jesus thinks it takes to be his disciple. If you abide in my word, if you do what I say, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So the, the first statement there was that we do what he says. The second statement was that we abide in his word or his teaching. And the third is that one of the core parts of his teaching is that we love God and love each other, right? And so if you do that, then by doing that, people will recognize you are one of my disciples. A rabbi decides what he requires of the disciple, not the other way around. We would think it's the other way around. We have this idea of cafeteria Christianity where you have your tray of, and you go along the cafeteria line and you take some of this and some of that, but you leave the, the, the lima beans. You don't want those. You keep going and maybe you take two desserts instead of one. And you just keep, you know, that's cafeteria, the cafeteria mindset. But that's not, that, that's common in our society, like the self help books that people read. You know, this one helped me with this, but not this. And this one over here is useful for that. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is Jesus defines what it means to be a disciple. We don't define what it means to follow Jesus. And so we have to be careful to let him define that for us. And so what are the things Jesus stresses, I would say, more than anything else when it comes to being a disciple, is commitment. It seems like that, more than anything else, is what he wants. And so I want to look at two aspects of discipleship. The first is the cost of discipleship, and then the second is the rewards of discipleship. Okay, so the, I'll give you the cost first, tell you the bad news, and then I'll tell you the good news. No, I'm just kidding. But the cost of discipleship is up first. And so Jesus, when he first picked the 12, he had taught them the Sermon on the Mount. They had been with him for a time. They had known what he was into, what he, his teaching about the kingdom. They saw his healing ministry up close and in person. And then Jesus sent them out. And that's what we read in Luke chapter 9. Jesus sent them out. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So there's a nice summary statement of what he has the disciples doing is proclaim the kingdom of God and heal. Seems suspiciously similar to what Jesus himself was doing, right? Isn't that exactly what he was doing? And so he sends them out to do what he was already doing. And he said to them, take nothing for your 
journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Isn't that a wonderful description? Uh, this brings me to another point. When you're reading the Gospels and you're, and you're seeing the statements Jesus makes to his disciples, it's important that you ask a question. And that question is, is this something that relates to these people at this time? Or is this something that relates to all disciples of Christ throughout all of time? That's an important question to ask. Because in this instance here, right, Jesus says, take nothing. He says, no staff no bag, no bread, no money. You shouldn't even have two tunics, two garments with you. Is that a principle that Jesus expects all of his followers for all of time to always do? No. He didn't even expect his disciples to always do that. This was just for this mission. He called the twelve together, gave them this power and authority and mission, and he sent them out for a time to do this job, and then they then he came and collected them, or they came back. I'm not sure which way it went, but then they were together again. And then Jesus later on sent out the 72, and they came back, right? And so I've actually met somebody that thought this was true for all time. Yeah, I did. He was walking down the road, and he was barefoot, and he had one garment and no money. And he felt that to follow Christ, he had to live this, this way. And so... What ended up happening is he became a burden on, every, on all the other Christians because he's not, he's not working a job. He's just walking around barefoot. And we, we gave him some hospitality, but then sent him on, on his way, you know, like keep doing what you're doing, I guess. You know, and look, I'm not going to judge somebody if God specifically calls him to do that. But if you misread this as, as being the only way to do discipleship, then that's... That's no good, right? So this is for a particular time and place. And I think it's important to recognize those times as opposed to other times where Jesus will say something in general for uh, disciples. All right. Uh, the next point on the cost of discipleship is that Jesus knew they were going to face persecution, right? This is from Matthew chapter 10. Jesus talks about how he sends them out as sheep among wolves. Let me tell you, that might be a cliche in our society, but it wasn't in theirs. That would have been a pretty fearful description of a dangerous situation, right? Um, and he says that you're, you're going to get flogged in the synagogues. You're going to get dragged before governors. Um, they're going to deliver you all over, and the Spirit is going to help you know what to say in those situations. Families are going to fall apart. Brother will deliver brother, father his child, children are raised up against their parents, and everyone's going to hate you for my name's sake. Who's ready to sign up? <laughs> He's like, you're going to get beaten up, you're going to get persecuted, and everyone's going to hate you because of my name, because of who I am. And then he goes on to, uh, uh, well, then he says, he who endures to the end will be saved. And then he says, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. He's still talking to this group of 12 on their mission that, you know, if, if they persecute you in one town, you just go to the next town and preach there. This is not to say that every time a Christian suffers persecution, they have to move. All right. But it was true for that mission because they were depending on hospitality, which was a major aspect of their culture. And, um, you know, he says, you're not going to get through the whole place before the son of man comes. He's going to come to these different towns as well. And then he goes on to say that, look, they called me Beelzebul. You think they're going to love you and treat you nicely? You know what I mean? They call, you're not better than me. That's what Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 10. So he sends out the 12. And then later on, he sends out the 72. And it says they return with great rejoicing. And people were always flocking to Jesus. You know, I want you to think of uh, Jesus as having these rings around him. And on the outermost ring around Christ, there would be all these curious onlookers. Dozens and dozens of people. Maybe even, at some points, hundreds of people. And they would be curious people. Like, what? You know what draws a crowd? A crowd. <laughs> so if Jesus already has a group around him, other pe and he's walking through your, your, your village, or he's out in the field, 
you know, you're out in the field every day, and there's usually not a crowd passing through. So what do you do? You put down your pitchfork or whatever, you, you, and you, you go and you, and you what, what's, he, what's he saying? Right? So there's a lot of curious onlookers. There are critics, people that don't like Jesus. They're in that outer ring. There are a lot of sick people in that outer ring that want to be healed or uh, demonized people who are looking for relief. And then he had an inner ring within that of the people who actually were trying to follow him and his teachings and to be disciples. And then within that, you have the 12, right? And those 12 are the ones that Jesus works with most closely. And then even within the 12, you have the three, James, Peter, and John, with whom Jesus works the most closely. And so you have these different rings that are all around Jesus. And sometimes he would speak to just his, his 12 disciples. Sometimes, like when he goes to the Mountain of Transfiguration, he just, he just takes Peter, James, and John. And then other times, he addresses the whole crowd. And this is one of those times here in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. It says, and he said to all, not just to the 12, but he said to all, all who might be interested, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. I love how Jesus says anyone there. To be a disciple of Jesus, you don't have to be smart. You don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to be good looking. You don't have to have a status or a rank in the society. His call goes out, if anyone would come after me. And I love that about him. But then what does he say to that person? Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So there are three statements there, right? You have deny himself, you have take up your cross daily, and then follow me. You want to know what it takes to be a disciple of Christ? Those three things. Deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow him. Now, taking up the cross, I think you know what deny yourself means. It means you don't just do whatever you want to do. You're going to, you're going to take on what he says instead of what you say, what you think. But taking up a cross, we might think of that as a metaphor, as bearing suffering or something like that. In their society, that was the death penalty. That was the, exec the means of execution, was crucifixion. And so he's saying to them, you've got to be willing to die. If you want to follow him, you've got to be, I mean, it's, it's a life or death commitment, potentially, here. And the reason why I know that, too, is the next thing he says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. I mean, he's, he's not joking around. These are not all metaphors here. He's saying, if you are going to um, save your life, you will lose it. If you lose your life for my sake, you will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So that's how he would talk to people. Jesus was wildly popular. People were interested in what he had to say. People loved Jesus, generally speaking, because he was a healer, because he spoke with authority, because he cast out spirits. But not that many people said, okay, I want to be your disciple and I'm going to follow you. Because Jesus made it this real for people. Look at another example. This is from Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone... There it is, that anyone again, right? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What? <laughs> to us, that's really, really hard to take on, right? Because, I mean, it's like, shouldn't we love people? Isn't this the same one that taught us to love our neighbor as ourself? In another place, he teaches to even love our enemies. So, but we're supposed to hate our parents and our children and our brothers and sisters and ourselves. Didn't he say love your neighbor as yourself? <laughs> so, how, what's going on here? Uh, I'd like to quote C.B. Caird, who wrote a book called The Language and Imagery of the Bible. He says, Consider the use of the words love and hate. When the Hebrew uses these words, he may mean by them what we should mean affection and detestation, but he may merely be using an absolute turn of phrase to express a preference, where we should say, I prefer A to B. He says, I love A and hate B. And so what Caird is saying here is the Semitic peoples tend to speak in absolute terms 
all the time. And so if I want to say something is, is, is really great and something's really terrible, that's, that's no problem. I love this. I hate this. But if I want to say, I like this better than that, the, they would still say, I love this and I hate this in, in a way to say one is better. Let me show you an example here. This is Genesis 29, verse 30 and 31. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. You see that? He loved Rachel more, loved more, and served Laban for another seven years. The next verse, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. Right? Now, Either we went from a relationship where he loved one and he loved another one more to a relationship where now he hated her or we're just using different phrases to say the same thing. Okay, And I want to make the case that Jacob, with all his flaws, did not hate Leah. In fact, he had several children with her after this situation. Okay, And so I don't think he hated her at all, but in comparison... It was this one more than that one, so they used the, the term hated. Here's the same verse we were looking at before, Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife, right? So you've got to hate your parents. Uh, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This is a similar saying from Matthew chapter 10. So the first is from Luke, the second one's from Matthew. So you can compare, and that's kind of the use, uh, usefulness of having multiple Gospels, is you can compare. And here it says, whoever loves father or mother more. So in the first one it says you have to hate, and the second one it says you've got to love, if you love them more, then you're not worthy of me. And then again, whoever loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And then the same follow-up statement, and whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So you can see that what we're talking about here is not literal hatred. We're talking about preference. And Caird concludes by saying these words, Jesus is not advocating the abandonment of family ties, let alone misanthropy, but is demanding that where there is a clash of loyalty between the claims of the family and the claims of the kingdom of God, the service of the kingdom shall come first. And a lot of times that happens. A lot of, especially in their society where it's much more of a group mindset than an individual mindset. Where a family would turn you out if you chose to follow this um, charismatic leader. So what is Jesus saying then? He's saying, if anyone comes after me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, just even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You see that? He cannot be my disciple. If Jesus says that, we've got to pay attention to it. Right? Because that's big. That's not a little thing. That's a big thing. He's saying, if you do this, you cannot be my disciple. Excluded. And what it is, is if you put your family ahead of me. Now, that is radical. Jesus is saying he needs to be before your parents, before your kids, before your siblings. And then he even says, even his own life, even before your own life, right? So what is he saying here? He's saying you have to be committed to me first, loyalty to me first, before literally everyone else in your life. And then the second uh, statement here, verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There it is again. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? Right? So the first is you have to have him first in uh, your commitment beyond other people. And then the second is whoever's not bear his own cross. If you're not willing to go all the way, you can't be my disciple. Right? Cross was the way they got executed in their, in their time. Right? Uh, so if, unless you are willing to sit in your own electric chair, you cannot be his disciple. Right? I mean, this is strong stuff. This is, this is Jesus. It says, look at the verse 25. Now, great crowds accompanied him. He had all these people. He said, look, come to me, anyone. But if you come to me, you're not going to be a part-time disciple. He does not take part-time disciples or partial disciples. He wants full, committed disciples. And then he says, look, if, if somebody's going to build a, a tower or some sort of building... You sit down and you figure out if you can afford to finish the project before you start it. And then he gives this other example about going out to battle 
And if you find out the other guy has twice as many soldiers, you're going to send out a delegation to ask for peace before the battle actually happens, right? And then he goes on to say, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. There it is again. Cannot be my disciple. So three things. The first is he's got to be first before other people. You've got to be fully committed in the sense of even to the point of death. And the third was that you cannot renounce all that you have. I mean, that, I think that's talking about possessions, that, that he comes before any of these other possessions that we would have as well. Verse 34, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I love how Jesus is so strong in, in what he says. He, he says it so strongly. He's like, bad salt is not even good for the manure. Like a banana peel is good for the manure pile. You know what I mean? Like old paper is good for the manure. Like what isn't good for the manure pile? You know, but that's how worthless you're going to be if you don't have, if you don't, don't retain your flavor is what he's talking about here. And then he just has this, lo I love this little cryptic bit at the end. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, if you, if you can catch what I'm saying here, God bless you. And a lot of people didn't have ears to hear. A lot of people were just like, is that the same guy that healed Aunt Mabel? <laughs> is he the one that multiplied the bread loaves? Is this that guy? Oh, man, he's a riot. Did you hear what he said? You know, and that's just that. It's just like a novelty. Like, oh, look at this one. Right? But then there would be a few that would say, there's something about you. I want to do it. I want to go all the way. I want to be one of your disciples. In John chapter 6, there's this incident where Jesus is talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And there he is speaking metaphorically. Uh, John, <laughs> John chapter 6. And uh, the, the people are just totally grossed out by what he's saying. Uh, because Jews are really finicky about blood in general, animal blood. But human blood is even worse. And uh, they were, you know, just couldn't even, couldn't, couldn't catch it, right? Verse 60. So when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? <laughs> but Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit which gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And there are some of you who do not believe. Verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Isn't that something? So that Jesus would bring them in with the miracles and then send them out with his words demanding absolute loyalty. Right? Um, and then he says to the twelve... Verse 67, do you want to go away as well? Everyone's leaving. You can just imagine the scene, right? Just a big crowd peeling off one at a time, and then now it's two at a time, now it's five at a time, now dozens are leaving, right? And Jesus is, you know, in a moment here where he says, do you want to go away too? Are you going to leave too? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. <laughs> Great answer. To whom shall we, who are we going to go to, Jesus? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. All right, so that's what Jesus says it takes to be his disciple. It has nothing to do about your intelligence, your looks, your family history, your medical history, or whatever else in our society would be important. For him, one thing matters, commitment. Are you committed? Are you going to be loyal? Are you... Are you absolutely willing to do what he says? And if you are, you could be his disciple. Simple. And there are some significant rewards for that. Look at, uh, I'm sure I have this in your notes, Matthew 11, 28. If I have it on the screen too. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. So what are the rewards of discipleship? Come to me, all who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hmm. That sounds pretty good to me. What do you think about that? Rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is offering to help people know where to go. That's what a yoke does. It confines the animal to a certain direction because he's yoked to another animal that's also going in that direction. And Jesus' yoke is, is light. You don't have to go chase after the Buddha and Muhammad and this new, new age thing that just came up or secularism and atheism. You can come to this rabbi, this teacher, and he will give you rest for your soul where you don't have to figure you know, every little thing out and you never have any certainty. You can have rest for your soul. He'll guide you. He'll show you where to go. So I think that's one significant reward of disciple. But there was this other time that Peter asked Jesus, well, you know, every, we left everything. What do we get? I love that. It's so honest. And Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, dumb question. What's wrong with you? No, he doesn't say any of that. Does he? he just answers them straight. Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So what are you going to get? You're going to get participation in my kingdom. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the anointed one that God has uh, pointed out and chosen to rule the age to come, which translated here, the new world. And so he says, look, you followed me. You're committed to me. You're with me. You're my cabinet. I'm the president. You're the cabinet. You're going to rule over the 12 thrones. And he promises this not just to his disciples, but to us as well. If you look at Revelation 2, 26 and 27, he says, Everyone who overcomes and keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. So this is not just or the way um, it, we, we have it in um, 2 Timothy 2.12. It says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. So this is not just exclusive to the 12. Yeah, they are going to be over Israel, but anyone who follows Christ is going to participate in the kingdom to come in that reign. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, do you not realize that you're going to judge the world? Knock it off. You know, they were suing each other. Knock it off. Don't you realize you're going to judge the world? <laughs> so this is part of the package as a reward of discipleship. And then the other and third and final point I want to make about discipleship, the last reward is closely tied to that. This is the next verse, Matthew 19, 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will, what? Inherit eternal life. That's a big deal, right? Yeah, that's a good one. John, uh, seven, John chapter 10, 27 to 28, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. I lo this is like one of my favorite two verses, uh, two verse combos. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. Do you hear his voice? Does he know you? Do you follow him? Those are the questions, right? And I give them eternal life. There it is again. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. I love that one. That's a good one. So the rewards are guidance today, promise to reign in the age to come, and ultimately eternal life. And so I think those are some pretty good rewards. What we're going to look at next is how Jesus, uh, I call it Jesus' paradoxical submission, how he related to the Father. If you enjoyed what you heard here, why not give Restitutio a five-star rating in iTunes or Stitcher? Doing so will help others find this podcast and inspire them to love God, follow Christ, and seek truth wherever it leads. Thanks for listening, and check us out online at restitutio.org where you can find an archive of all the podcasts, as well as a bunch of articles and links to other resources. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.